then you test in terms of the accuracy. The next is I simply give, because this is a wide topic and very interesting, I will not go into details, but I will simply take two algorithms maybe to explain because they perform better than others, like recurrent neural network and uh, long-term, short-term memory. I'll just use the two to explain what is happening. Yeah, because like conventional neural network that I just mentioned, the COV1D is good for time series, but they don't have memory. They don't keep whatever they have learned. So it's chances are they are likely to make mistakes when making feature predictions. So that is why recurrent neural network and uh, long-term, short-term memory, they're better. So recurrent neural network, this, this is just trying to compare. This is the simple neural network I, I, I'm talking about on the, on the, on the left-hand side. It doesn't keep any memory. But for the recurrent neural network, you can see, once it has learned, it saves it. But the challenge is that it has what we call short-term memory. Because it's, it lands and then keeps it for future prediction, but then it has a problem with memory because it, it doesn't keep long-term memory. And then, uh, let me say, it's like there's a problem called problem with vanishing gradient because it's, it's completely, it's, 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 it multiplies the weight, the input weight, and the, uh, the learning rate. And you know, if there's uh, an error in input rate, then chances is that this error will be carried forward. So chances is it may make good predictions, for short term, but when you do it for long term, it, it may it's likely to make mistakes because it's carrying errors with it. So this is the advantage of again our next uh, algorithm, which is now sh uh, long short term memory. Long short term memory, just like the, the I think I, I try to use slide that can tell more if I don't explain everything. It has both long term memory and short term memory. Long term memory is 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 a uh, is the one that keeps memories that are long term, and then it is able to learn and relearn and forget, like selectively forget what is important and learn new and keep what is important. So it has, this is done by use of what we call gets. We have forget get that is able to is removes literally removes what is not important, and then we have input gets that now takes what was in previous memory, what is important that is kept in the uh, long-term memory. And then it's not what we call now output gate. Output gate is what updates the memory now so that what he has done is keeps it forward. Yeah? It keeps it in the memory. You can see most of them are, are there. Yeah? Now having introduced maybe basics of machine learning, I will go um, direct to my results. These are the results, these are the parameters and the factors that you had to consider before deciding on which, which parameter or the size of, uh, of uh, data size to use. Because you can see, a small data size gives you, does not give you good accuracy. Like on the y-axis, we have accuracies in terms of, with the one representing 100%, so 0 0.8 is 80%. And on the y axis, what we have the uh, data size. You see that as you increase the data size, accuracy increases sharply until it's such a point of now, point of called on, uh, point of diminution. And whether whether you increase now the size of data, the the model is not learning anymore. Like the data is now enough for it. But this comes still this one advantage that even if you increase the data size, the accuracy may not be increasing, but the certainty, like the reprodu uh, reproducibility of your results is higher if you use larger data set. So it's a, it's a kind of, you have to do a lot of balancing in terms of which parameters size of data set to use. That is why, and just for information, I settled on around 10,000 data sets, mainly because of computational limitations and uh, just for better results. Because you can see at 10,000, it gives you, it gives you like you can see here, at 10,000 here, it gives you generally accuracy the same around 80%, around 81%, but you can see that the uncertainty is low. For example, you could get even higher percentage by using 3000, but you can see the uncertainty is high. Like you're likely, if you do it again, you're likely to get out of, like you can get better percentage, then you do it again, you get a lower so uncertainty is, is kind of reduced if you use small data size. But if you use a larger data size, like 50,000 would have been better because it has the least uncertainty, but now computational uh, limit, limitation is a factor. That's why I didn't use 50,000. But it's a better option if you, if at all you are not considering computational limitation. 
these are the results. Also, because of time, I may not be able to present the 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 results for other 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 algorithms because mainly because they not perform maybe better. So, recurrent neural network. This is the result for recurrent neural network. For recurrent neural network, you will see that uh, I used one fifty epochs, and then you you see the the improvement in terms of how the machine is the model is learning with the uh, epochs until it, it until it reaches a point of diminishing returns when now whether you increase it it's not learning anymore and one thing about this thing maybe that i need to mention here somebody will ask what if you just increase the number of epochs got you are not losing anything you are because one is that you are taking a lot of uh, computational uh, time and uh, uh, power the number two is that at this point when now the model begins to overfit. Where now in terms of uh, the losses are, are now beginning to increase because they should reduce as the accuracy increase. You can see this is here, demonstrated here. The red line is for training accuracy. The blue one is for testing accuracy. Then uh, I don't know whether this is purple. <laughs> is for training loss and then validation loss. So it, it, at some point, the validation loss will begin to increase. As you can see, it's almost increasing at some point. So you have to be very careful in terms of setting your parameters right. I'll, I present result for uh, LSTM. You can see the, the other one percentage was 61% training accuracy with testing accuracy of 58%. I've just explained what is training accuracy and what is testing accuracy. Training accuracy is simply how the model learns, like how how many how, what is what is what is it classifying correctly, and then testing accuracy is now simply in terms of now you are going back and compare which one has been classified correctly. This is how it learns. The other one is how which one is true positives and now true negative. That's why it comes in. Now I go to LSTM. LSTM, you can see an improvement because. Uh, training accuracy goes to up to 70%, with test accuracy increasing to 66%, and even the losses reducing to 0 0.5. Yeah, but there's a problem with this that you can see that as it runs faster, one thing to mention is that it takes a lot of time again to train in terms of training one epoch, but overall it takes less time. But training one epoch takes time. Another another problem is that it easily overfits. Like you could see, the training accuracy is beginning to increase just after the eighth epoch. You can see it's beginning to increase here. So so that is a challenge. And this is a challenge. What we call overfitting. Yeah, which I will explain maybe when I'll be presenting the next slide where we have improved LSTM. One thing again to note is that uh, number of epochs has reduced by almost. The other one I used 150. This one I'm now using 15 because it's, it's faster train based on training one epoch. Because within few epochs, it has learned a lot. Now this is improved LSTM. We improve the other LST. I improved the other LSTM now from 0 0.9, from 0 0.2 or 0 0.7 to 32 percent now to almost 90 percent, with the testing accuracy increasing from 66 to 86. And then you can see, as much as somebody may say that the model may be overfitting, but remember that time it was overfitting from around eight epoch, but you can see it's now almost stable. It's like it's not overfitting the way it used to, it did in the, in the, in the just the conventional LSTM. You can see in terms of training, uh, training loss, there's no increase in losses. It has learned fully here. Yeah, so you can see a lot of improvement by simply improving this. Improvements are done by one is that you have to set prominent features. For example, the other one, the other one will not was not able to learn what are the prominent features. For example, prominent features maybe you are just looking for the amplitude. You are trying to compare because they have to be detected in three observatories. You have to compare whether it's detected in the three. You have to prepare in terms of changes in frequency and velocity and those things from the from the from the now the the your time series that are all the, the plot. So it has to go through all the under compare. But the other one maybe maybe is not getting the problem here. It's using a lot of features, some of them which may not be very important 
to use for classification because it's trying to see the features and then make prediction. This is a wave, this is not. But it's using some features which may not be common or may are not prominent. So by improving this, you make it learn prominent features. Uh, and in terms you tell it in terms of dropout layers, what to leave in terms of the forget that I was talking about, what to leave and what to not what to keep and what not to what to to actually remove from from your your cell. That is a LSTM cell. Then uh, I thank you. And then I want to take this time to appreciate the ASA committee and everybody else who was involved in in all this. I really appreciate because it's a privilege to to present here. Thank you. If there are any questions. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you for joining us. Um, there was a there was a question this morning. Um, it was probably quite high level for a lot of people. Um, but there was a question this morning about gravitational waves in, in South Africa, in Africa. Um, Takalani meant we need to be developing that community to support it. Um, and it's great to see that that's developing in Kenya really. Uh, so thank you for sharing with us. I really appreciate it. Is there any quick question while we're running behind time? Um, otherwise, we'll yeah. move on. To